So now on Job chapter 26. Well, as we continue, we continue on apologetics and we're, we're looking at the Bible aspect of it. Uh, I want us to look at Bible proofs number two. We looked at a little bit the last week. Now tonight we're going to look at the Bible's factualness and scientific accuracy proves that it is the Word of God. The Bible's factualness and scientific accuracy proves that it's the Word of God. Everything the Bible says is true. I mean, the first thing it says is that we're all sinners. Well, is there an argument about that? The only people that say they're not sinners is crazy people. Because we all know we're sinners. I mean, you're delusional if you don't think you've ever sinned. And so we, we know that to be a fact. No one has to teach us that. The Bible told us, and we know it. Then the Bible's true in its statements about everything. Every statement in the Bible, talking about anything and everything, is true. As we look at the remarkable record of Job, uh, we find that the Bible, though it's not a scientific manual, it is scientifically accurate, even from its earliest pages, which were written, what, 4,000 years ago? Though the Bible contradicts evolutionary theories, it does not contradict any established scientific fact. Evolution is not a fact. It's a theory that man has come up with and has nothing to prove that it's true. So I want us to look at some examples of the Bible's scientific accuracy, beginning with statements that come from the pages of Job, which Job is thought to be the first book that was written. So Job could be 4,000 years old, the book of Job. And the references are modern in its perspective. It never gives a hint of myth mythical exaggerations like some books you read. You know, it talks about how the world began. And, you know, it'll talk about just weird, really weird things of how uh, the world is held up by an elephant and, you know, the world's flat and just on and on. All kinds of odd, oddball things that we know, everybody knows, are not true. Well, the thing about the Bible, there are no fallacies. There is no scientific mistake or fallacy found in the Bible. So Job chapter 26, verse 7. Job said the earth hung on nothing. Job 26, verse 7. And again, remember, this is 4,000 years ago. He stretched out the north over the empty place and hanged the, sun upon, or the earth upon nothing. The earth was hung upon nothing. Well, like I said, some people thought the earth was held up by a turtle, the back of a turtle, some the back of an elephant. Uh, you go into uh, Greek mythology and Hercules and Atlas, I guess. It was Atlas who held up the world. So you read the Bible and it says, no, the earth is held up by nothing. And it is obvious to us today. I mean, we figure, yeah, that's right. But it wasn't obvious 4,000 years ago or 2,000 years ago or 8,000 years ago. To previous generations, they had no idea. They just go, went by the common myths about the earth. Now, the second thing Job said was that the earth had weight. The earth had weight. Look at chapter 28, verse 25. To make the weight for the winds... And he weigheth the waters by measure. All right, the weight, the weight of the winds. It was not until the 17th century when Galileo discovered that atmosphere had weight. And the modern science of aerodynamics is based on this scientific fact. Further, the weight of the air is important in the function of the Earth's weather. The weight of the winds controls the worldwide air masses and movements, and transports the water that's been evaporated from the ocean inland over the continents, and then it, it comes down as rain. So we see that the, before anybody even had any idea about the wind and about the air, Job said that it had weight. These are really were 
complicated scientific things. The third thing is Job described the springs of the sea. Job 38, verse 16. Job 38, verse 16. Hast thou entered into the springs of the sea, or hast thou walked in the search of the depth? The springs of the deep. Man had no way to know about freshwater springs on the ocean floor firsthand. There was no observation until recent times. Modern science has discovered there are thousands of underwater springs that add millions of metric tons of water to the ocean each year. But Job knew that. How'd he know it? Because God told him. It's God's word. It wasn't that Job was so smart. It's just God said, write this. And so he wrote it down, not probably understanding what he even wrote. But the Bible is true. Uh, Job 38, verse 19. Job understood that light has a way and that darkness has a place. So let's look at verse 19. Where is the way where light dwelleth? And as for darkness, where is the place thereof? Well, Job said that, that light had a way. That is, light is not to be located in a certain place or situation. Neither does it simply appear or disappear instantaneously. Light does what? It travels. Light travels. It dwells in a way. It's always on the way to someplace else. You know, the sun rises. We say the sun rises, not actually the sun rising. But we, we see the light of the sun come to the earth. As the earth turns away from the sun, it gets dark. But that light's still traveling. This light is always traveling. And usually it travels in waves. And sometimes it seems to move as streams of particles. But it's always moving. And when the light stops, what is there? Darkness. There's darkness. Thus, darkness is static. It has a place. Darkness has a place. But light is dynamic. It's dwelling in a way. So the light's always moving, but darkness stays. And when light comes, then it, it fills the void and, and takes away the darkness. So let's look at verse 24 of this same chapter. The Bible says that light creates wind. Chapter 38, light parted, which scattered the east wind upon the earth. By what way is the light parted, which scattereth the east wind upon the earth? It's only in recent times that modern weather science has discovered that wind is created as the sun heats up the earth's surface causing the hot air to rise and the cooler air to fall, creating weather systems. And that's what Job was talking about. Then let's look at chapter 36 of Job. Job describes the hydrological cycle. Job 36, verse 27. For he maketh small the drops of water. They poured down rain according to the vapor thereof, which the clouds do drop and distill upon man abundantly. So here he's talking about the process of evaporation and condensation. That wasn't discovered till the 17th century and not well really understood till the 20th century. So here the Bible's describing it 4,000 years before. The Bible says that plants and animals produce after their own kind. Let's go to Genesis now. We're done with Job. Let's go to the book of Genesis, chapter 1. Genesis 1, verse 11. And God said, Let the earth bring forth grass, the herb yielding seed, and the fruit tree yielding fruit after his kind. Is dying, so turn this back on. Um, so, this is perfect harmony with everything that can be observed and tested by modern science. There's a great variety within kinds, there are different types of 
roses, and there are different types of dogs, and there are different types of horses, but there is no reproduction between kinds. Between roses and dandelions. Roses don't bring forth dandelions. Dandelions don't bring forth roses. Dogs do not bring forth penguins. Uh, you know, that's, that's not how it is. Everything brings forth after its own kind. We know that. There's been experimentations with fruit flies. They, they've been used in genetic experimentations. Uh, since the 1900s, ten, tens of millions of fruit flies have been bombarded with x-rays, doctored and poisoned. The result has been this. It's a fruit fly. A variety of mutant fruit flies, but, sorry kids, Spider-Man didn't come from that. You know, you don't have a man and a, and a spider, or you don't have a man and a fly. That's not what happens. And so the proof of the Bible, 35 hundred year old statements that all creatures re reproduce according to kind. Go to Genesis 22. In Genesis chapter 22, the Bible says the heavens cannot be measured and the stars are without number. Genesis 22 verse 17. That in blessing I will bless thee, and in multiplying I will multiply thy seed as the stars of heaven, as the sand which is upon the seashore, thy seed shall possess the gate of his enemies. Then look at Jeremiah 31. Jeremiah chapter 31. In Jeremiah 31 and verse number 37. It says, Thus saith the Lord, if heaven above can be measured and the foundations of the earth searched out beneath, I will also cast off all the seed of Israel for all that they have done, saith the Lord. Before the invention of the telescope, man could see a few hundred stars with the naked eye. But the very first book of the Bible says there are without number. That's been confirmed by modern science. There are 300 billion stars in our Milky Way galaxy alone. In 1999, observations from NASA's astronomers using the Hubble Space Telescope suggested that there are 125 billion galaxies in the universe. Now, that's what they suggest, but we know science is always messed up anyways, so there could be more, there could be a little less. The most update up-to-date star count was announced in July of 2003. How would you like to have this job? They counted 70 sextillion observable stars. So I would have hated to have been the people that would have been looking at those stars. But it just goes to prove what the Bible said. It's without number. The stars are as the sand of the sea. It's without number. Just what God said. The Bible says there are paths in the sea. We saw that there were springs in the sea, but it also says there are paths. So let's go to the book of Isaiah. Isaiah 43. Isaiah 43, verse 16. Thus saith the Lord, which maketh a way in the sea and a path in the mighty waters. Make a way in the sea and a path in the mighty waters. Let's go to Psalms 8. Psalms 8 and verse 8. The fowl of the air and the fish of the sea and whatsoever passes through the paths of the seas. Now young people, I'd be taking notes on this, writing this stuff down, because when you talk to kids in school and they tell you the Bible's not true, you can say, wait a minute, let's see what the Bible has to say about these things, because they just listen to what other people have to say. So these things would be important for you to have written down so that you can, you can show them out of the Bible what the Bible prophesied and predicted, or didn't prophesy, but, but said was true long before scientists ever come to know it. So the paths in the sea, this is interesting. Since the 19th century, the ocean currents or paths have been charted, and ships travel these paths just as trucks travel on roads. Writing in the mid-1800s, Matthew Fontaine Murray, superintendent of the U.S. Navy Depot of Charts 
and instruments in Washington, D.C. observed this. There is a river in the ocean, in the severest droughts it never fails, and in the mightiest floods it never overflows, its banks and its bottoms are cold water, while its current is warm. The Gulf of Mexico is its fountain, and its mouth is in the Arctic seas. It is the Gulf Stream. Now, since that discovery, there have been a whole lot of other paths that have been discovered in the sea. And so the Bible told us there are paths in the sea long before man had any idea about that. All right, here's another one. The Bible says that life is in the blood. Let's look to Leviticus. Leviticus chapter 17, verse 11. For the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it unto, uh, I have given it to you upon the altar to make an atonement for your souls. For it is the blood that makes an atonement for the soul. So he says that the life of the flesh is in the blood. Then he goes on to talk about that the blood also atones man for uh, for sin. But this was written three thousand five hundred to four thousand years ago. But it wasn't understood scientifically until recent times. For centuries, doctors used bloodletting as a healing method. George Washington, America's first president, probably died prematurely because of the bogus practice of, of draining blood from people. Modern medicine has learned that the Bible, what the Bible's taught all along, that the life of the flesh is in the blood. The amazing system of vessels and capillaries transport the marvelous blood cells with their life-giving oxygen and other necessary elements to every part of the body. So our blood carries the, the elements that we need. It carries the oxygen we need. It carries the nutrition uh, and life to the organs within us. And so truly, life is in the blood. The blood also forms a major part of infection fighting and clotting systems, which are necessary for the life of the flesh. Now, the Bible is not a book of science, but whatever the Bible te- te- a touch, whenever the Bible touches on science, it is accurate. This proves its divine origin, because all of our ancient books are filled with gross scientific blunders. Even science books written a mere hundred years ago are filled with errors. We have a Bible that's not a science book that's completely accurate any time it touches on science. Well, let's look next at the Bible's candor. The Bible's candor proves that it's the Word of God. When men write biographies about their heroes... uh, They commonly omit or whitewash faults, but the Bible exhibits its divine quality by showing man as he is. Even the best of men in the Bible are described with all their faults. We read about Adam's rebellion, Noah's drunkenness, David's adultery, Solomon's apostasy, Jonah's pity party, Peter's disavowal of his master, Paul and Barnabas' petty strife, and the disciples' unbelief in the face of Christ's resurrection. The Bible was written by Jews, yet it candidly describes the faults of the Jewish people. Their stubbornness, their unbelief, caused them to wander in the wilderness for 40 years. Their idolatry during the period of the judges is very much told. Their rebellion that caused them to be rejected from the land and scattered throughout the earth for two millennia their rejection of the Messiah, all of this is in the Word of God. Nothing is whitewashed, nothing's covered. You know, you'd think the greatest heroes in the Bible, the bad things about them would just be covered up. But no, it's all given to us as plain as can be. It describes the faults of the best men. The Bible's indestructibility proves that it's the Word of God. Above all books, all other books combined... The Bible has been hated, vilified, ridiculed, criticized, restricted, banned, and destroyed, but to no avail. 
It didn't stop it. In A.D. 303, the Roman emperor Diocletian issued an edict to stop Christians from worshiping Jesus Christ and to destroy all their scriptures. Every official in the empire was ordered to tear down churches, burn them to the ground. Every Bible that was found in their district was to be burnt. Twenty-five years later, the successor of Diocletian was Constantine. Constantine issued another edict ordering 50 Bibles to be published at government's expense. In 1778, the French infidel Voltaire boasted that in a hundred years Christianity would cease to exist. But within 50 years, the Geneva Bible Society uses this man's printing press and house to publish Bibles. Robert Ingersoll once boasted, within 15 years I'll have the Bible logged in a, or lodged in a morgue. But Ingersoll is long dead and the Bible's alive and well. The communist regimes, regimes in uh, Russia and China tried to destroy the Bible and its influence, but they've been completely unsuccessful. There are more churches in Russia today than ever before in its history, and the presses cannot print enough Bibles to satisfy the insatiable demand in the communist country of China. In fact, many who set out to disprove the Bible have been converted instead. Let me give you a few examples. A man by the name of Gilbert West, an English poet who was included in Samuel Johnson's book, Lives of the Most Eminent English Poets, while a student at Oxford set out to debunk the Bible's account of Christ's resurrection. Instead, he proved to his own satisfaction that Christ did rise from the dead and he published the book Observations on the History and Evidences of the Resurrection of Jesus Christ. George Littleton, an English statesman, author, and poet who was educated at Oxford, evidently you didn't really want to go to Oxford and become a believer, <laughs> determined, he determined to prove that Paul was not converted, as the Bible states. Instead, Littleton wrote a book proving evidence, or providing and proving that Paul's conversion was real and its evidence that Jesus actually rose from the dead. The book was entitled Observations on the Conversion of Apostle Paul. Frank Morrison, a lawyer and journalist and novelist, set out to write a book to disprove the resurrection of Christ. Instead, he was converted and wrote a book in the defense of the resurrection entitled Who Moved the Stone? Simon Greenleaf, a royal pro professor of law at the Harvard University and one of the most celebrated legal minds of America determined to expose the myth of the resurrection of Christ once and for all. But through his thorough examination, it forced him to conclude that Jesus did rise from the dead. In 1846, he published an examination of the testimony of the four evangelistic evangelists by the rules of evidence administered by the courts of justice. William Ramsey, a renowned archaeologist and New Testament scholar, began his historical research in Asia Minor with assumption that he would find evidence to disprove Bible historicity. He concluded, though, that the book of Acts was written during the lifetime of the apostles, and it is historically accurate. And that's one of the things that he thought was such a fallacy was the book of Acts. And by the time he got done with his studies, in Asia Minor, it proved to him that the book of Acts was historically accurate. His discoveries led to his conversion to Christianity. Now here's a name that most of us have heard of, Josh McDowell. He was a skeptic when he entered in the university to pursue a law degree, but he accepted a challenge by some Christians to examine the claim that Jesus Christ is God's Son. He says, I decided to write a book that would make an intellectual joke of Christianity. He traveled throughout the United States and Europe to gather evidence to prove his case, but instead he was converted to Christ and wrote a book defending the Bible entitled Evidence That Demands a Verdict. And if you don't have that book, it's an excellent book. It's, an, it, you know, it's not King James, but it's an excellent book on proving uh, the resurrection of Christ and the life of, of Christ. After trying to shatter the 
historicity and the validity of scripture, he said this, I came to the conclusion that it is historically, historically trustworthy. If one discards the Bible as being unreliable, then one must discard all literature of antiquity. In other words, all ancient writings have to be discarded too. I believe that we can hold the scriptures in our hands and say the Bible is trustworthy and historically reliable. And this is his book, The New Evidence. So person after person that tried to prove the Bible was false and wasn't true and that Christ didn't rise from the dead all come to the conclusion that he did. He was, he did come to this earth and he did die on the cross and he did rise again. So down through the ages, the Bible has been a mighty anvil that has worn out the puny hammers of scoffers. The next thing we see is the Bible's universal appeal proves that it's the Word of God. In spite of all the attacks against the Bible, the Bible is still the most popular book in the world by far. Some books have been translated into a few dozen languages, but the Bible whole and in part, has been translated into every major language of the world, plus most minor ones. More than 2,450 languages so far. Translation work is progressing in another 2,000 languages. Compare this with other religious books. The Hindu scriptures have been translated into 46 languages. The Muslim Quran into 40 languages. So the Bible is the most popular book in all the world. The eighth thing is the Bible doctrine of salvation proves it's the word of God. Do you know that the Bible is the only religious scripture that teaches the doctrine of salvation by grace? Every other, every other one teaches salvation by works. The Hindus say that salvation is attained by practicing dharma, and working out one's karma. The Islam belief says that salvation is by surrender to Allah and obedience to his commands. Buddhism says that salvation is by reaching nirvana through life works and meditation and asceticism. If you visit the Buddhist monasteries, any time of the day you're going to find Buddhists walking clockwise, fingering their prayer beads, and twirling their prayer wheels in hopes that uh, they will uh, satisfy enough that they can work out their salvation. The Bible, on the other hand, says that salvation is God's free gift to sinners. This is a gift that was very costly to the giver. You know, some people scoff. Well, if it's if it's such so great, why is it free? <laughs> it isn't free, really. It's free. For the receiving, but look at the cost of the gift. It costs God, His only begotten Son, on the cross of Calvary for you and for me, for wretched sinners who could care less about Jesus. It was purchased with a great price, the atoning sacrifice of God's Son on the cross. But for the sinner, it's free. For by grace are you saved through faith. It's not of yourself, it's a gift of God, not of works lest any man should boast. The Bible says there's nothing that a sinner can offer God in order to atone for his sin. I mean, you can't crawl on your knees and bloody them up enough. You can't beat yourself enough. You can't give enough money. There's nothing you can do that would atone for your sin. It's the shed blood of Jesus Christ. It's accepting what Jesus could, did. What could we offer? Righteous works? The Bible says our righteousness is nothing but what? Filthy rags. Could we offer money? No. God doesn't want our money nor need our money. What would the God of creation do with pathetic currency? A pure heart? The Bible says the heart is what? Deceitful above all things. Desperately wicked. How then could we purchase our own salvation? We can't. We're all unclean. We're unclean things. All of our righteousness is nothing but filthy rags. We do fade as a leaf, and our iniquities, like the wind, have taken us away. 
Salvation is free, unmerited gift of a loving, deeply compassionate God. As the Christian hymn goes, we owed a debt we could not pay. He paid a debt he did not owe. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. The Bible, what a book. It is the perfect word of God. You know, you don't have to have doubts. The Bible is God's word. It proves itself over and over and over. And if you just take these things that we just went over and just a minor part, a few, we didn't cover all the things in the Bible that prove the Bible to be true, but just a few. And just looking at them, we should be convinced that this is the word of God. An open mind is convinced that there's something about this book. That it knew the it, it knows things that man didn't know, and of course he knows the future that man doesn't know, and it's given us the plan of salvation from the beginning to the very end. Let's stand with our heads bowed. Lord, we give you thanks this evening for your word. As we're studying uh, apologetics and studying, Lord, the answer to the questions that the world might have. That, Lord, we would be convinced more and more and more, our faith would grow and grow and grow and be strong, Lord, of how that you are uh, absolutely, without doubt, our God and our Savior. And that you gave us a book that we can read and study and know the truth. And these things I ask in your name. Amen. With our heads bowed, we begin our invitation. Savior say, thy strength indeed is small, child of weakness watch and pray, find in me thine all in all, Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe, sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white. Amen. You may be seated.